Now, let's talk about financial independence. When I meet Mr. Shelf, I'm not in good shape. Here's where I was when I met him. Pennies in my pocket and nothing in the bank. Because the story of the Girl Scout with the cookies had just occurred in my life. And now I meet this man. Here's what he said. Now to get started in a whole new direction, here's what you need to do. You need to develop a financial statement. So just make a little note on your notes there. If you haven't ever done it, this is not a bad place to start. A financial statement. And a financial statement is very simple. It's a piece of paper with a line down the middle. On this side is the value of all your assets. And over here is all of your liabilities. Here's what you've got in terms of worth. And here's what you owe. And then when you add up all of the value of your assets and you add up all that you owe called liabilities, we come up with what we call now finally, when you subtract one from the other, your current net worth. Now this is not your net worth as a father, this is not your net worth as a parent, this is not your net worth as a friend. There's all kinds of worth and value. But if you really want your economics to go better, here's a good place to start. Key phrase, take a picture of where you are. And here's what it's called, the truth. <laughs> now you don't have to publish this in some local newspaper, right? This is all private stuff. But there's, you, you have to say, you know, finally, there's no use kidding myself. I gotta take a picture of where I am. I gotta know how good it is or I gotta know what? I gotta know how bad it is. I gotta know how much I'm on the upside or how deep a hole am I really in. So this is what I started. It was a simple little program of coming up with my current net worth. My liabilities, that was easy. I owed my parents, I owed, I owed, I owed. I made the third uh, borrowing on my car and he was threatening to come and get it, drag it down the road, rear end up in front of my neighbors. So I had plenty of liabilities. On the asset side, I am really, I put my furniture even, I, I put everything I could think of, my shoes, I mean, wouldn't the Salvation Army give me two dollars for my shoes? I mean, I am scrambling. And when I did this exercise, guess what it did? It really soberly gave me a current picture of where I was. And guess what? I was unhappy. But here's what's important about the truth. It sets you free. Number one, free to correct old errors in judgment. That's what the truth is for, to correct old errors. After six years, I started working when I was 19. And when I took a picture of where I was, it was not a very happy experience. So now, where do we go from here? in putting together a financial statement, realizing exactly where we are, no nonsense, this is the real deal. We don't have to share it with anybody, but we do need to know the truth for ourselves. Now here's what we need. Number one, perhaps a new philosophy. Let me give you sort of the simple philosophy of the rich and the poor. Here's the philosophy usually of the rich and the poor. Poor people spend their money and invest what's left. Here's usually the philosophy of the rich. The rich invest their money and spend what's left. It's just a little turn of semantics. But the little turn of semantics is like the turn of the set of the sail that takes you in a whole different direction to uh, wind up at a good place in one year or a place, you know, of average, mundane, where you don't really want to be. Just that little simple shift of philosophy so here's the key, think like the rich, invest your money first, then spend what's left. Don't spend your money and invest what's left. When I gave this little class one time at a school class, the teacher said, you know, you must not, you know, promise people that with a little bit of investment every month that they can, you know, make their fortune because people nowadays are overloaded, they're spending everything they make, you know, their standard of living is right up there. And I said, well, that's, this is where it all begins. 
I said, could we think of someone, and this was a long time ago, of course, that makes $2,000 a month? She said, yes, no problem. We can probably find someone that makes $2,000 a month. What would this couple, this family tell you it takes to pay all the bills and just keep their head above water? And she said, well, 2000 I said, could we possibly find somebody not far from here that makes $2,500 a month, right? Maybe even both working combined. $2,500 a month, $500 a month more. What would this family say it probably takes to pay all the bills and keep your head above water? What would they say, right? 2500 So I said to her, what happened to this $500? How did it disappear? Wisely invested over some reasonable period of time, the return is unbelievable. And she said, I never thought about that. So jot this down. The money is always there, either to spend or invest. The difference in what you do with it is based on philosophy, not economy. It isn't the state of America's economy that makes the difference. It's the difference in your philosophy. Right? That illustration? Here's a book on how to get rich. It costs $20. Somebody says, well, a poor person can't buy that book. Say, no, it's only seven Coca-Colas. And you either spend the money on seven Coca-Colas or a $20 book that teaches how to get rich. So jot this down. Everybody has the money. Even the poorest of the poor. The key is how to spend it. The key is what to spend it for and how you spend it. First, how you earn it is determined by your philosophy. Second, now, how you spend it is determined also by your personal philosophy. So what would be a good philosophy to follow? And this is the little simple form I want to give you on financial independence, wealth for the future. It won't take long now to jot this down. It takes a little longer to go do it, but here it is. What to do with a dollar. If a child asks what to do with a dollar, here's my suggestion. Never spend more than 70 cents. Here's where the other 30 cents goes. 10 cents, 10% 10 of your income for charity, church, whatever, supporting worthy projects, teaching children here to become generous. If kids understand generosity, they'll give you 10 cents out of every dollar that they earn. And this is a good place to start. It's easy to give 10 cents out of a dollar. A little more difficult to give 100,000 out of a million. You say, oh, if I had a million dollars, I'd give 100,000. I'm not that sure. <laughs> we better start you early, right? So that when the big money comes, it'll just be automatic. You won't even have to think about it. Okay. All right. So 10 cents for charity and church. Here's the next 10 cents. Active capital. Try to make a profit. It's called buy and sell. I learned to do this starting at age 25. It's how I made my first fortune. Buying and selling. Like the little boy who buys a bottle of soap for $2 and sells it for three. Active capital means you try to make the profit. Buy a piece of property and improve it and sell it. Active capital. Keep saving up this active capital until you've got some to work with to buy and sell. Make a profit. Now the third 10 cents is passive capital which means let somebody else use this 10%. You put this to work and see if you can't make a profit. This is to let someone else use it. You are the passive partner in providing the money. They are the active partner in seeing if they can make a profit and pay you dividends and stock increase and, and uh, whatever, interest. And that little formula is a good place to start. Now, you might not really be able to start there. I call this the ideal. Maybe by the time you've heard this, you're in such bad financial shape that you have to go here, 97, 1, 1, and 1. That right now you're in a trap. You're caught. 
and it's going to take you a while to get out. So right now, you've got to spend 97% of your income, right, for your living and lifestyle because, you know, you're caught, you're obligated, you know, and there's no way out. And then the rest of these now are just one, one, and one. The key is to start with something. Now, Mr. Schof gave me a comment. It has served me all these years. Here's the comment. It's not the amount that counts. It's the plan that counts. When I first met him, I said, if I had more money, I'd have a better plan. He said, no, if you had a better plan, you'd have more money. So if you have to, you start with 97, 1, 1, and 1. Then what do you do? Now comes the project right away of trying to get this 97 figure to go down and these other three numbers to start going up. This now becomes an exciting game to play. In another seminar, I talk about measuring progress. This is, this is one of the great motivating factors in the world, is to start something and make progress. Start something and make progress. See, Jim Rohn told us the ideal was 70, 10, 10, and 10. But I can't start there. I've got to start with 97, 1, 1, and 1. And here's what you've got to understand. This is okay. I mean, if this is where you have to start, that's where you have to start. Then you start driving this number down and start driving these numbers up. And it's a whole game to play till finally you can arrive at this pretty good ideal way what to do with the money you earn from a paycheck or from dividends or from whatever sources. 70, 10, 10, 10. I mentioned the name Sarah Alfaro in Mexico. I taught her this, and she's been teaching it to the people uh, she's responsible for over all the last 10 years. And some of them now are doing extremely well, making big money, and they've got houses and cars and, you know, all kinds of stuff. 70, 10, 10, and 10. Now, when you start getting into the big money, these numbers have to change again. I probably don't spend more than 10% of my income. So if, I, if this number for me is 10%, you can imagine what these other three numbers probably are. So if you have to, you start here. Get to the ideal. And then when it really starts to flow in your favor, you rearrange this program again 10%. Because if you're doing big time, you know, you couldn't spend 70% of your income, it would be obscene. <laughs> Here's the next one now. This is only a suggested plan. You know, this is not written in any law. You know, most advantages and benefits for the future are not written in law. There's no law that says you must not have a heart attack. Where is it written? There is no law. That you must demand of yourself. There is no demand that you have a good financial plan that'll safely take care of your family for the future. There is no law. You could be careless and lose it all and finally have to be supported by the state. So there is no law that you must be responsible and have a good financial plan. You must demand it of yourself. So I'm asking you to make that note. It's what we demand of ourselves that counts. There's no law that says you must have a health plan that's gonna make you extremely healthy for the next 10 years. There is no law. That you must demand of yourself. And those are the disciplines now that really start to count, the ones you demand of yourself. So, next, keep strict accounts. Keep strict accounts. Have you ever heard this expression? I don't know where it all goes. Did you ever hear that? Oh, we'd love to have you run our company. You don't know where it all goes. Did you ever hear this? It just gets away from me. Oh, we'd love to have you run the world. It just gets away from you? Okay. Will you make the note now? Keep strict accounts. This is for your own self-esteem, as well as safety and financial matters for the future. Keep strict accounts. 
you've got to do it, you know, for the IRS. You've got to do it for the tax uh, bill that comes due. Then there's one more. Be happy to pay your taxes. And this is an assignment that's one of the toughest. I'm trying to finish this book I've been working on for so long. Hopefully I'll get it done one of these days. And the title is, Of Course Kids Should Pay Taxes. And it's a little book on really everybody should pay taxes. And then you need to know why. In California, if a 10-year-old walks into 7-Eleven and buys something that costs a dollar, the proprietor asks the child for eight more pennies. Does the child have a right to know how come we're asking him for eight more pennies? And the answer is yes. The kid says, I'm only 10 years old. And the proprietor says, congratulations, you're my youngest taxpayer. <laughs> now the kid wants to know, who gets these eight pennies? Where does it go? And here's what the proprietor, if he's wise, says. Well, if you want to ride your bicycle on the sidewalk instead of in the mud, you have to pay the eight pennies. Everybody pays the eight pennies on every dollar so that we have streets and we have a sidewalk So you don't have to ride your bicycle in the dirt and the mud you got the sidewalk and now the child understands. Okay, here's my eight pennies So jot this down now everybody has to pay We can't let anybody off the hook Because all of us are in this together And you can't build your own section of the street out in front of your home what kind of equipment would you need to build your own piece of the street out in front of your house? No, you can't do that. So we take these collective needs that all of us need, and we ante up the money, whether it's federal or state or sales tax or whatever it is, so that all of this is taken care of us. Here's what it's called, the care and feeding of the goose that lays the golden egg. You say, well, the goose eats too much. That's probably true. <laughs> but make this note. Better a fat goose than no goose at all. So everybody has to pay. How much do you think aircraft carriers cost? We can't use used missiles. Here's where else the money goes. So you'll be safe in your bed at night while the policeman walks the beat. While we sleep, the Air Force doesn't sleep. While we sleep, the Army doesn't sleep. While we sleep, the policeman walks the beat and checks the doors. That's where the money goes. Once you have a vision of where the money goes, yes, for some things it costs too much. Yes, the government sometimes is too extravagant. Yes, yes, all the yeses. But all those yeses are true for all of us. Sure, the goose might eat too much, but who doesn't? <laughs> Should we have confession time here today? <laughs> Say, no, no, no. Please let me off the hook. So you got to do the same with the government. Yes, the government needs to go on a diet and slim down and not spend quite so much. That's also true. But it's true of what? All of us. This is the deal. We're in all of this thing together. So finally, when I understood what this was all about, I finally became a very strange creature called a happy taxpayer. <laughs> That's it. Now, should everybody pay? Let me give you one good illustration that comes from the Bible and I'm finished. Jesus one day, and I'm an amateur on the Bible, but here's a classic story. The storyteller says, Jesus one day was out in front of the synagogue watching people come in, and with him were his disciples. So Jesus and his disciples are watching people come in to the synagogue. And the custom was, before they came into the synagogue, they deposited a contribution. They deposited the contribution, went on into the church. The story says some came with large contributions and went in. Some came with small contributions and went in. And as the disciples and Jesus watched, a little lady came along 
and she put two pennies in the treasury and walked in. And Jesus said, look at that. And his disciples said, two pennies, two pennies, what's two pennies? He said, no, you don't understand. She gave more than everybody else. They said, two pennies is more than everybody else? He said, yes, because I'm sure that two pennies represented almost all of what she had. So since her two pennies represented almost all of what she had, she gave the most. What a classic philosophy. Now, here's what did not occur. I'm so brilliant, I can give you what the storyteller left out. <laughs> here's what did not occur in this little scene. When the little lady put her two pennies in the treasury, uh, Jesus and his disciples did not run after her and say, hey, hold it, hold it, little lady. Uh, hold it, little lady. Uh, we've observed what's happened with putting the two pennies in the treasury. And we've decided that uh, you're so pitiful and you're so poor that we've decided to give you back your two pennies. I'm here to tell you that did not occur. So make this note from this little story. Jesus left her two pennies in the treasury, even though it was most of what she had. That's such a classic lesson in philosophy. That's such a classic lesson in what all of us are involved in, in making contributions. Shouldn't everybody wish to pay? The government has decided to leave some people that they consider poor and pitiful off the tax rolls. See, that's unthinkable. Shouldn't they, even if they only paid a dollar, so that they can be able to say what? I pay. I make my contribution. No matter how poor I am, if all I've got is pennies, I give some as contribution. Whether it's taxes or whether it's benevolence or whatever it is. Okay, isn't that a great story? It's a good story.